the co-sponsors of legislation in Washington State, Senator Rebecca Saldana has joined us today. Thank you so much for joining us, Senator. We're glad to have you here. And we would love to hear all about how Washington State decided to adopt this policy and how it's working to help reduce pollution uh, or how it will work to reduce pollution in your state. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me join you. I'm excited to be with you. We, um, so I am uh, Rebecca Saldana, State Senator of the 37th Legislative District in Seattle, Washington. I represent our historic red line communities um, and um, unincorporated King County, as well as um, also parts of the city of Renton, which is south of the city of Seattle. Happy to be here with y'all. So in terms of um, the clean fuels policy and how our state came to this, well, we do have a governor, Governor um, Jay Inslee, who's now in his third term, um, who came um, as a climate champion and has for many years, um, for sure the six years I've been now serving um, in the in the Senate, that um, ha this is the key policy that he sees as critical to addressing the pollution in Washington state because we are um, a state that's blessed with a lot of um, hydro, which um, you know means that we have a cleaner grid to begin with. And so we did do 100% clean energy a couple of years ago, um, but much, um, just as you had spoken to, much of our pollution that remains is in the um, transportation sector. And um, we have um, the clean fuels policy as um, a, someone that grew up along our red line communities and also along our, our freeways and by our airports um, in order to address the um, health disparities of our communities along the I-5 um, and the airport, this policy became the policy that I came around to, not initially, um, because it was a little hard to understand like where the revenue was coming from or how the investments would happen. Um, but as I um, served, this policy became the thing that seemed really critical to my community so that we could begin to invest in the kind of clean technologies and alternative fuels for not just individual vehicles, but for our fleets, for our bus systems, for um, the maritime, which is huge here, as well as um, jet fuel and so and our heavy duty um, um, freight. And so this policy, um, you know, was his priority and Representative Fitzgibbons, who is, um, you know, I think taking a much uh, deserved um, vacation break is not um, he has been the prime sponsor. And so he had more progress in the House, but in the Senate, it just didn't get daylighted. And so I think two years ago, ago I um, joined him as a prime sponsor in the Senate to begin the conversation. And thankfully, this year, um, for the first time, the Senate was able to successfully um, vote it off the Senate floor and get it to the governor's desk. So can you tell us a little bit about how, um, what obstacles you had in order to get the bill passed? Sure, many. Um, most um, be that... Um, our uh, may all of our business association oh, well not all that's not fair and um, we have our clean technology um, business association and that has grown its base um, over the years but when we first started um, there were very few um, large businesses and mainstream the business um, lobby um, was a hundred percent opposed to it um, our transportation um, uh, chairs, and were opposed to it in large part because they um, understood and our building trades um, were largely opposed to it because all of these entities were looking at California um, and um, interpreting data to um, to make the claim that this would make it hard for us to be able uh, that it's going to it make it be hard for us to be able to come up with new revenues um, for transportation in the future. Um, our, our transportation um, budget is highly reliant on the gas tax as many uh, states transportation um, uh, budgets are. And um, as we know, um, that is a volatile revenue and it's one that's declining. And so um, they um, feel very uh, worried about that. The other piece is um, for um, folks that are struggling and for and, and 
I assume it's the same in many parts of our country. Um, in our state, right, um, there was um, a lot of um, displacement and gentrification. So a lot of um, immigrant and first-time home buyers and people um, that were looking to, um, you know, have a piece of the American dream were driving were, were driving to qualify. And so more and more folks were moving out of um, our green greenest district, which is ours, um, to um, to suburbs that were never built for people like me um, or for my communities. And so they, um, in order to be able to um, put food on their table, they're having to drive old cars and and um, drive further distances. And so there was definitely a contingent of uh, many of us um, uh, that were worried about the price point for individual drivers as well, that um, low, ed- low income folks and how would how is this going to um, hit them in their pocketbooks as well. So those were a couple of things, but definitely the oil lobby and um, the, the auto lobby and um, and then those other considerations. So ultimately, what what obviously you you managed to get the bill passed. So how were the price considerations addressed? Well, I mean, I think uh, I think they were um, balanced in a couple ways. I mean, so in it, um, I do think. And this is a place where mm, I think we have some studies in there because we passed a whole slew of bills this year, um, including um, what we, you know, said we have um, the climate commitment bill, which puts the a cap on um, carbon, and um, and uh, dedicates um, 5.1 billion of that revenue over the next um, decade towards transportation. So we were meeting some of our transportation um, budget writers' um, concerns, um, as well as um, building trades and others that want to see us build, want to uh, see us build into preservation and maintenance of our transportation system. And um, and I think the other piece too is that we've our environmental justice communities and um, our environmental communities um, and have been doing more work. Um, we've done we've had ongoing studies. I just got off a call around talking about ultra ultra um, fine particulate matter from um, our current um, jet fuels um, and the impact it has um, on already um, communities that already have disparate um, health outcomes. Uh, so we also. Um, know that we have a, our young people um, are um, getting more active um, from Black Lives Matters last year, um, and the the you know, and there's more interconnection that's happening around coalition building about seeing the connection of the impact to our health, the impact to our lives, um, the impact to our climate, um, the fires that we experience out here in the West, and wanting to see um, action taken on climate. Uh, we also have um, a lot of disability folks that have been advocating and organizing um, with our EJ folks around um, the kinds of investments we want to see. We want people to be able not to drive. There's 25% of our population that can't drive or doesn't drive. And so how are we actually building a system that works for them as well? And so I think all those things kind of added up. Um, and, you know, I think part of it is like, we're a part-time legislator, a leg, a leg, um, legislative body. And so, and we have a two-year budget. And so I think when you introduce something, you always have to know that um, it's probably going to take at least um, two to three um, bienniums to sometimes get something through because you have to educate your colleagues. And we also, I will say the last thing is we've had the most diverse legislative body in um, our state's history. And, um, and we came with a mandate um, to do better and to be bolder in how we um, legislate. And so I think the fact that we have, um, I mean, we have democratic majorities in the Senate and the House and in the governor, and it, we also have a democratic governor, um, that is definitely part of it. And of those um, caucuses, we have more women, um, we have um, a, a growing black caucus and you know, and we have folks that came in wanting to be um, climate and environmental champions. That's very helpful um, to hear how various different uh, contingencies you know got together uh, to advance to advance us in Washington. Um, we have a few panelists to talk a little bit more about these issues because I don't think Senator Parker has joined us yet. Um, that uh, can, I think, go into a little bit more depth about um, what we're looking at here in New York. 
Um, we have uh, Tim Cortez, who is the Chief Technology Officer for Plug Power. Tim, would you like to tell us a little bit about the work that Plug Power does? Yes, thank you very much for having us. So Plug Power is a leader in hydrogen fuel cell technologies, um, as well as hydrogen. Um, we're based in Latham, New York, because that's where our headquarters is. Um, we, we created the first market for um, hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle technology uh, within the material handling market. So within distribution centers like Amazon, Walmart, Home Depot, um, many of the large companies that have retail applications, they use forklifts in their, in their facilities. And we've replaced many of those uh, lead acid batteries in those forklifts with, with hydrogen fuel cells. Um, so today we've deployed well over 40,000 fuel cells. Um, those customers use well over 40 tons of hydrogen a day. Um, and an interesting fact for, for people. So last year during the pandemic, 30% of all the food and groceries that were shipped in the United States were touched by a plug power hydrogen fuel cell in, in its transportation. Um, in addition to the material handling market, we've invested quite a bit in future applications. So we are looking at transportation. Um, we're building an innovation center in Rochester, New York, where we'll be building um, fuel cell stacks for the transportation market, medium heavy duty um, applications, as well as large stationary applications. Uh, about two years ago, um, as part of our strategy for plug going forward, our five-year plan, we identified hydrogen and particularly green hydrogen as a significant element of our business. And we decided to vertically integrate into that particular space. So we did it, two acquisitions last year. And one of the acquisitions was a, an electrolyzer company um, based in Massachusetts and also a liquefaction, hydrogen liquefaction facility um, in Tennessee. Um, with those, those acquisitions, we're now in a position where we've identified five locations within the United States that we're gonna be generating green hydrogen. Um, one of them is in Western New York. Um, we're gonna be using hydropower at that facility. Uh, and by 2025, we're going to have about 500 tons of hydrogen, green hydrogen generated, and we're going to be expanding that to over 1,000 tons um, in those locations and in locations across the country. So um, significant business for us to be in the clean space, particularly with hydrogen, um, and just happy to be here and happy to be part of the panel. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Tim. Um, next, we have Ben Mandel, who is the Northeast Regional Director at CalSTAR. <clears throat> ben, can you tell us a little bit about CalSTAR? Sure, thanks so much for having me, Julie. Really happy to be here. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining us. So CalSTART is a national nonprofit uh, non clean transportation technology consortium. Uh, we've had a Northeast regional office that's been based here in Brooklyn since 2013. And CalSTART really exists for the advancement of clean mobility solutions that drastically reduce global and local transportation emissions. We've got more than 280 members at this point representing all aspects of the clean transportation value chain including transit and delivery fleets, car, truck, and bus manufacturers, um, electric vehicle and alternative fuel infrastructure, solution providers, utilities, and more. And so what we do is we work with our industry partners as well as public agencies um, and hopefully legislators to put in place the right conditions for our highest efficiency transportation solutions to thrive. So what we see in New York is that many of the right pieces are already in place, including purchase incentives for electric cars, uh, trucks, buses, and more recently, a utility investment structure, uh, namely make ready investment approval. But for New York's goals to really take off, we feel a clean fuel standard would do wonders to round out the clean transportation ecosystem in New York. And so we're really excited to delve into that more this afternoon. Great, thank you. And our last panelist this afternoon is Shelby Neal, who is currently Vice President for Renewables and Energy Policy at Darling Ingredients. Uh, Shelly, can you tell us a little bit more about, about Darling? Sure, Julie, thanks. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. So Dar Darling is a, is a global diversified company focused on sustainable solutions. So we produce a wide variety of products, everything from sustainable pet food to organic fertilizers uh, to our core business, which is use cooking oil collection. Uh, we have facilities in Buffalo and Newark that are focused on use cooking oil collection and processing as well as waker, uh, bakery waste products. And then we have a large investment in a renewable diesel processing facility, which is the largest renewable diesel producer in North America, uh, about 700 million gallons by the end of this year. Very cool. Um, so I want to jump right in. Um, ben, can you give us a little bit of an overview about what a clean fuel standard is? We sort of touched on it 
in, in um, less direct ways, but I think it would be helpful to sort of just explain to people what a clean fuel standard is. Right, and it might also go by kind of different names in different jurisdictions, like the state senator pointed out from Washington, as well as California's approach, which we'll talk some about. But fundamentally, a clean fuel standard is a, a program to establish a declining standard for the carbon intensity of fuels used throughout New York State. So this would generate credits for fuels that are less carbon intensive than the standard, like electricity, hydrogen, or biofuels, and generate deficits for fuels that are more carbon intensive than the standard, namely petroleum products. So what this type of standard does is it establishes a market wherein deficit generators purchase credits from credit generators, and that creates revenues that can either be used uh, are reinvested, I should say, in the transportation system, in improvements, or to reduce the effective cost of lower carbon, higher efficiency fuels. So in short, a clean fuel standard is a budget neutral polluter pay scheme to accelerate clean transportation investment. Great. That was a very efficient answer on that. It is a complicated, it is a complicated thing. We actually created a little video <laughs> to educate people because it's so complicated. Um, so Tim, how, how has a clean fuel standard helped to reduce the use of fossil fuels and reduce climate pollution in other states that have been adopted? Or how would it help in New York, do you think? Yeah, so, so in California, use California as an example, they're, they've been very aggressive early on um, and moved policies towards their low car carbon fuel standard. And effectively, it's created a market access for low carbon fuels to be more competitive with the traditional fossil fuels, including low carbon hydrogen. Um, and there's a requirement for that hydrogen um, that's being used in some of those applications to be of a low carbon. So it's really critical to drive those applications. And that, that implementation that they've put in place really has reduced their greenhouse gas emissions, um, as well as reduced some of the other particulate matter um, that they've seen um, through the years. So um, the, the policy really has fostered industry to focus on those solutions um, that really to help them pursue um, to make that program very successful. And it has created a framework for project developers to also identify projects um, within the space that are now viewed as bankable by the investment community. That's also an important piece is that, that cost piece and how do you get those projects implemented. Um, Oregon has implemented a similar program. Um, and, I, and I really don't see any reason why New York could not take some time to understand what are the positive aspects of each of, of what's happened in California, Oregon, also understand some of the concerns that came out of those programs initially, and then drive a similar, similar policy here, um, as long as it's done quickly. Um, you know, obviously for all of us, um, time is important in getting to solutions quickly um, to reduce the, the carbon, the, you know, the carbon footprint, reduce greenhouse gases and really help uh, overall from, from a community standpoint. So it's really important that these activities be, be done, but they be done in a very swift manner. Great. I see that we have been joined by Senator Parker. Are you there, Senator Parker? Yes, I am here. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So we're glad um, that you could I, join us. I'm in, I'm in my car, which is a hybrid. So by the way, so that's, you know, until, until we get my bill passed, uh, you know, this is how, how, how we're doing it. Uh, thanks for having me. And, and, and I think this conversation is important. One of the things I appreciate about this, this conversation in this context is that we don't have to kind of argue climate change, right? Like we understand that climate change is a real thing. In the state of New York, we obviously accepted um, that we're in a doomsday scenario as it relates to carbon. And so we passed the CLCPA, the most um, aggressive set of uh, climate goals in the entire country. Um, and I think that the low carbon fuel standard is actually a next best step in, in making sure we get to those goals. Um, we have about 2.5 million vehicles in the state of New York. We really need to change them all. Um, we have some time to do it. And I think that the first step again is to can, you know, create the standard that creates a, a, a both stick and carrot, but mostly an economic um, um, uh, incentive um, for us to kind of move uh, towards a different set of, of fuels in order to, uh, to run our vehicles um, and other things that we operate with fuel in the, in the state of New York. And so I'm happy to be the center sponsor of, it, of, it, of the legislation, um, uh, working with uh, Assemblywoman Warner on this issue. Um, and she's providing a great amount of leadership and want to thank her for our partnership on this, on, on this important issue. And certainly, um, the, you know, the league who has been uh, doing an excellent job at helping me reach out to my colleagues and kind of building some momentum um, around this important legislation. 
helps to not be on mute. <laughs> what what do you see um, as some of the challenges in moving towards a sort of a you know our, our ultimate goals? Right, you passed the legislation not that long ago to get to uh, you know 100% zero emission vehicle sales uh, by a certain time, like 2035 for light duty and 2445 for medium and heavy duty. Um, so how do you see the, the clean fuel standard sort of helping to facilitate some of those objectives? I mean, I mean, obviously, I mean, you know, we're not going to go from zero to 60, right? Automatically, right? Like you're going to have to, you know, build our way there. And I think that the low carbon fuel standard gives us an opportunity and some intermediary goals to get there before we, you know, before we uh, get all in. And so uh, I think all of these, all of this legislation works together um, and, and helps move the ball and help us matriculate the ball um, down. Uh, you know, we all wish that we could uh, just turn a, a, a key or flick a switch and get to a place where we were all at a, you know, using, you know, zero carbon methods to, to, to uh, energize the things we need to energize in, in the world, but that's not reality. And so, um, this helps us move the ball along. Great. Um, thank you for that. Is there any other advice you'd like to give our uh, audience today or thoughts before I jump well, back? Look, I, look, look I, I think that there is, um, the fight used to be around, again, around, around climate change and getting people to believe that their climate change was happening. We're no longer in that moment, thank God, right? Um, but we are now in a, a more advanced conversation and somewhat of a, a fight around how we now get to these climate goals and how fast and, and, and the immediacy of it. And, that's, and it's more of a nuanced conversation, but I think we need to be involved in it and I think we need to be organized uh, as we approach it um, and, and see what really actually works. And so that's the, the challenge in this moment. Um, is really, you know, it's kind of like having a family fight, right? Like it's easy to fight with strangers because, you know, you don't really know them now. This is kind of an internal, uh, like an internal fight um, that we all need to, you know, to be involved in and um, do it in a way um, where we don't kill each other because ultimately we're all trying to move towards the same, the same goal in the same direction and the same outcome. Um, you know, we just may have some different ideas about how we get there. And so I think a lot of education is needed because I think a lot of people just don't really have a realistic understanding of what these, of how the markets work and how the technologies work and about how fast we can get there. And we're having this conversation around low carbon fuel standard, but we're having it around, you know, natural gas as a bridge fuel. Uh, you know, we're having it in many different ways. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and so we just have to kind of, you know, hang in there with each other and continue to have no, conversations no, no, and no. and figure out how we no, get to a place no, um, where we're no, where we're kind of um, no, working no, together no, towards no, the same goals. No, no, no. Thank you so much. And um, I know you're doing this for your. I see um, a youngster in the back there who clearly we want to make sure we're providing clean air to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I have the window crack. Don't call it. Don't call child protective services on me yet. I do have a window crack. He's okay. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you so uh, much for joining us. I, I, I need to stop doing so much on the energy side and do some stuff, more stuff around daycare. <laughs> <laughs> people, people think that people are not going back to work because of uh, too much money and unemployment insurance is because they don't have no place to put their kids. <laughs> but that's a, that's another call. I'll talk about that later. Uh, that's hilarious. Well, thank you so much, Senator. We appreciate. <laughs> no, you can, it. Yeah, right. thanks for having me. Everybody enjoy the day. Thank you. All right, so coming back to our panel, um, uh, Ben, what what do you see uh, a clean fuel standard is, is doing to help clean up the transportation sector? And from your perspective, how has it worked in other places? I was hoping I wouldn't be the one who had to follow the Senator, but alas, Sorry. <laughs> I've drawn the short straw. Um, yeah, you know, so in terms of other places, I think, as has been noted, California is the best place to look for insights on recent experience and what we could expect in, in New York, but by no means the only uh, example. In California, the low carbon fuel standard has been in operation now since 2011, so more than 10 years, and it works through a market designed and administered centrally by the California Air Resources Board, CARB. CARB determines the life cycle greenhouse gas uh, emissions impacts 
CO2 equivalents associated with all available transportation fuels to determine basically the credit value for each fuel type relative to the standard in place for a given year. And that standard goes down through time as it tracks climate commitments. So right now, California is primed for a 20% reduction in the carbon intensity of transportation fuels by 2030 through its low carbon fuel standard program. Just to give you a sense of the aggregate impacts here, in 2018, the total value of credit transactions in California exceeded $2 billion for the low carbon fuel standard program. And it's really that volume, which is why California is seen as such a leader in clean transportation technology and innovation. Now, Oregon and Washington, as has been noted, and thanks to the Senator for joining us from Washington, have joined California in implementing clean fuel standard like policies. And that unifies the approach among West Coast states to fund clean transportation priorities. Now at the micro level, the experience in these other jurisdictions demonstrates that a clean fuel standard would effectively monetize the low carbon attributes of clean fuels for vehicle fleets. And here's one really concrete example. Late last year, California introduced a new cash on the hood incentive of up to $1,500 for passenger EVs called the California Clean Fuel Reward. This incentive is funded by utilities using LCFS credits they have generated from dispensing low carbon electric fuel in recent years and helps mitigate the need for a state budget allocation to keep their uh, prior clean fuel reward program for uh, EV incentives funded through the state budget. So I think that's a really indicative way of one thing we can leverage here to demonstrate the kind of budget neutral impacts but great transportation investment possibilities associated with a fuel standard. And I'm gonna follow up. Um, do you know what that might look like if it were, if we adopt this here in New York? Which part of it, the, the fuel? From the financial perspective, what kind of investment we might see based on the California experience? Um, I should probably have the Clean Fuels NY fact sheet up in front of me for that sum. Um, I mean, we're talking about billions of dollars, things like clean fuel standard, potentially transportation and climate initiative, um, you know, participation. These are measures that don't involve state budget allocations outside of the costs of administering such programs uh, and raise hundreds of millions of dollars a year in revenues from the polluters. Um, thank you for that. Um, transportation isn't the only only the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. It's also a major source of ambient air pollution impacting public health. And in particular, it's a, it impacts adversely low income communities and communities of color. Shelby, how could a clean fuel standard help improve air quality? Yeah, gr great question. Uh, you know, obviously, particularly in California, the beginning conversations were about greenhouse gas reductions and, and alternatives for reducing those. but. You know, I think what they found is that GHG reduction is really kind of a proxy for a whole broad suite of, of emissions reductions. Um, everything from, from particulates to heavy metals to aromatic compounds get reduced. And so when you look at these communities, um, you know, I'm glad there's a spotlight on that. It's, it's been too long and that, that that's been going on. It's kind of become accepted and that's unacceptable. Um, but really, that's the biggest opportunity ahead of us. You know, you look at ports, airports, heavy traffic areas. Um, you know, this is where, where a CFS is going to benefit first and, and most. Um, but I think when you look at the, the emissions that, that are not in alternatives and that are in petroleum, um, you know, it's really interesting. I mean, we have labeling on food now, but we don't have labeling on, on fuels and emissions. I mean, when, you know, you're kind of walking your kid to school or you're taking the dog out, you think, oh, it's a beautiful day. Look at that car that just passed. Well, you know, what you don't realize is that, that car is running on petroleum. You know, the, those emissions include, you know, all kinds of air toxics that aren't in alternatives like formaldehyde, benzene, tylene, you know, heavy metals like lead. We actually didn't take the lead out of gasoline, you know, arsenic. I mean, these are the things literally you're breathing in. And so if you just swap, you know, alternatives out for, you know, petroleum out for alternatives, you, you can limit those literally to zero. Um, you know, alternative fuels like renewable diesel aren't, aren't zero emissions across the board, but in many of the most important areas, they are zero emissions because of the biological feedstocks. Um, so this is really important. And so it has, perhaps not surprisingly, you know, when you stop breathing in things like formaldehyde and arsenic, that has a positive impact on your health. 
And so there was a, a study that was released a couple of weeks ago that, that showed, and, and it looked at Queens, the Bronx, and a number of locations on the West Coast that, that when you swap out petroleum for alternatives, and this looked at biodiesel, you can reduce cancer burdens by 46%, you reduce heart disease, you reduce lung disease, you know, the completely unacceptable fact of childhood asthma uh, is reduced. Um, and so there are major benefits. And, you know, the reason I'm so optimistic is that, you know, particularly on the diesel substitutes, which is most of these areas have heavy diesel traffic. That is a significant factor. Uh, products like renewable diesel, biodiesel can be substituted in immediately. Um, and we've seen that in California, more than 25% of the petroleum diesel in the state of California, which is the second, second highest diesel market in, in the country, one of the largest diesel markets in the world, 25% of the petroleum has been displaced. Even above that, when you look at things like electric transit and other things that have benefited uh, more than a bill, almost a billion gallons of fuel. So it's really important. And, and the city of New York, for example, has said you know, the day after a clean fuel standard is implemented, it will immediately transition all of its 13,000 plus diesel vehicles and equipment. And that in and of itself, eliminate emissions from 13,000 diesel vehicles that never leave the city of New York would make a difference. So Ben, can you touch on this uh, from the electric perspective as well? So obviously we're talking in part um, about uh, fuel, you know, liquid fuels, um, but there are also um, sort of a different way of looking at it from the electric side. Right, and liquid fuels are really helpful in the sense, you know, as Shelby mentioned, they're, they're ready to go now as drop-in solutions that really do help on climate and local air quality. When it comes to electric or zero emission solutions, we're talking about um, high order of magnitude investments that are needed. And of course, I think a lot of those of us on the panel and in the, in the audience today will agree that those are, are well worthwhile, right? But as you've noted, we're not even 10% of the way toward the, the 2025 EV goal in New York. Um, electric buses are coming really fast, but transit agencies and school districts will need lots of capital support to purchase buses and the corresponding charging equipment. And electric trucks are also gaining ground, but they face similar challenges associated with infrastructure, both in depot and at opportunity charging uh, along known freight corridors. Uh, so a clean fuel standard is a proven method to generate the significant amounts of uh, aligned revenue rather than relying on a state budget to support this kind of large scale transition that we need in terms of an infrastructure build out to support the electrification of those use cases. Secondly, I want to point out that the presence of a clean fuel standard can also, can also really generate operating revenues for fleets that offset the operating costs uh, of zero emission vehicles. So this would enable zero emission trucks and buses, for instance, which can cost far more than their diesel counterparts to better compete in terms of total cost of ownership. For instance, a battery electric medium duty delivery truck traveling about 100 miles per day in New York State would have an eight year payback period, even with purchase incentives in place to reduce the purchase price up front. Using California's program as a proxy though, Adding in fuel standard credits to the mix would accelerate the payback period to just five years. So it automatically shaves three years off the, off the simple payback period right there. It would also lead to a total cost of ownership that's nearly $100,000 lower for the battery electric option over a 10 to 12 year uh, service life. This is really important because while many of us are hoping that the state can adopt California's clean, uh, advanced clean trucks regulation, which requires progressively greater shares of truck sales to be zero emission from the middle of this decade uh, on forward. In order for such a regulation to be viable, it really requires that electric trucks have a beneficial total cost of ownership uh, in most applications. So the revenue stream generated by clean fuel standard credits would really help improve the operating economics for zero emission trucks and buses and would provide the, provide the right conditions for regulations to actually succeed which is something we're all hoping to see. So these are really um, policies and, and potentially regulations that can move forward in tandem. So that's on the electric side. Tim, what, what would a see if, what would a clean fuel standard do for the hydrogen sector, which is sort of emerging and new, especially when we're talking about green hydrogen? Yeah, so um, the, um, the McKinsey Group um, last year put together a roadmap for the US hydrogen economy. Um, and part of that went through 
what would need to happen to really take advantage of hydrogen in all the sectors, including transportation. Um, policies like the clean fuel standard are really one of the key elements um, to help drive that. And one of the things that they determined was that, you know, the US, the, the whole economy, including New York, would really benefit through, you know, the emissions reduction, growth, jobs, and the use of, you know, domestic resources in terms of the, the overall picture. And they actually anticipated that if you looked at the what could happen by 2020, 2050, um, within a, just a, in the hydrogen economy, um, there could be $750 billion worth of revenue, 3.4 million jobs created, um, significant reduction um, in the pollutants in terms of CO2 and NOx. So there, there is a, an important element associated with some of these policies. And you know, specific to a clean fuel standard, it really does um, provide that pathway for market access, particularly for low carbon hydrogen. Um, and that's hydrogen that's generated from renewables or through carbon capture and sequestration technologies. So it really would then put low, low carbon hydrogen on more of a cost parity uh, or close to parity with other fossil fuels. Um, and then it would really allow the industry to increase the generation that's needed and the investment in green hydrogen facilities. Um, and really for, for plug, one of the things that we feel is important, you know, for us, the planet is very important and we're making investments in, in all these areas like we're doing in, in Western New York with the facility we're putting out there. Um, but it really helps drive the innovation and investment because what's really ultimately gonna be needed in all these cases is scale. So we really need to be able to scale, scale up all of these solutions. Um, and with scale, we'll ultimately bring down the cost as well. So these programs help drive the scale and they also help drive the cost down in the future, which really would then push and allow hydrogen and some of these other fuels, low carbon fuels to be ubiquitous, um, which really would help multiple sectors, including transportation. Great. Tell me, what about on other renewable fuels? Uh, yeah, Julia, I mean, I think I would, I would echo Tim's comments about market access. I mean, I think that's really important. Uh, when I talk to, um, you know, some members of the legislature are more conservative, they, they always want to know, well, why don't, why won't the free market take care of this? And, and the answer is that the free market when it comes to fuel is not very free. Um, I mean, you have two major wholesalers in the city of New York. So you can go to this one or you can go to that one. And then when you want to buy fuels, there are about half a dozen companies globally that, that make petroleum. And so there's a high degree of, of control. It's very difficult if you're an alternative fuel to even get in the marketplace. So you now you have a half a dozen companies plus you know, the country of Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, who, who control the whole thing from the time it comes out of the ground till it comes in your pump. I mean, so you know, the next time you, you go and, and fill up your car, if you drive a gasoline vehicle, you know, look up at the marquee and, and tell me, do you see BP or do you see Shell or <laughs> which major oil company do you, do you see? So it's not surprising. It's just good business for them. But, you know, petroleum companies sell petroleum. They don't sell alternatives to petroleum. And so some sort of mechanism is needed to get these alternatives into the marketplace. And, and that's a CFS. I mean, a CFS really does two big picture things. One is it raises money for electrification during a time when, when it's nascent and needed. Two is it forces petroleum companies over time to sell less and less petroleum. And so when we look at California, it's done something really important. There's, there's an actual market in petroleum. If you're an energy marketer um, in California, you have options other than petroleum. You, know, you can do biodiesel, you can do renewable diesel, you can do low CI ethanol, you, know, you can put in electric chargers. And so there are a plethora of options and that's why we've seen you know, the prices be so stable in California. I would argue that this is, consumer positive, not just public health, not just the environment, but, but financially, we now have in these LCFS markets, a functioning free market. And that's critically important because we haven't had that for over a hundred years and people don't even realize it. Well, that's an excellent lead into my next question where I'm gonna ask each of you, what, what will the impact be of a clean fuel standard on, on cost? Um, so Ben, I'll start with you. You want to talk about impacts on costs for electrification? Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of the, the unit costs, right, when you go to, uh, let's say, a fast charger or, or the impact that uh, utility rate payers will feel, uh, it should be uh, at worst negligible and very likely actually cost beneficial, meaning that there will be savings to utility rate payers from greater utilization of electric system assets. 
right? So more kilowatt hours get dispensed throughout the system um, by a greater number of uses throughout the day and throughout the year. Uh, and that leads to less peaky system investments, better utilization, and a downward pressure imposed on, on utility rates, which is hopefully good for everyone. Tim, what about for hydrogen? Yeah, for, for sure for hydrogen, when we talk about scale, um, you know, the program and the policy could, you know, as I mentioned before, drive that scale. And we think about scale from a generation standpoint, we think about the capital required and the investments required. Um, and, and with a program like the CFS that allows that investment to happen, that capital um, to grow, and effectively over time, you start driving down the cost of, of hydrogen. Um, and that coupled from a renewable standpoint with the reduction in the low, uh, levelized cost of energy over time that we've seen you know, happen significantly um, over the last few years, um, we continue to see that, that cost come down, but it really comes down to the, the more demand that's going to be there based on these programs being in place. Again, that's just gonna drive the, the scale um, and that scale will then continue to drive the cost down. So, you know, our belief is programs like this will really help to drive the cost down of hydrogen overall. And Shelby, what about for diesel, the renewable diesel front, renewable biodiesel? Yeah, so on the, on the biodiesel and renewable diesel side, uh, when you have a clean fuel standard, biodiesel actually sells 75 cents to a dollar under diesel fuel. Uh, petroleum diesel is at par to maybe a quarter under. So pretty attractive, you know, dynamics, uh, you know, coupled with the fact that it's fully fungible in the fuel system, it's very attractive. But, you know, I think, you know, the, the big winners here, frankly, are the consumers because you have a, a fully functioning um, market. Um, I think Oregon said that, you know, it costs, the, the program costs are about four cents a gallon. And, and I think that's probably about right. Um, but then the question is to whom? Um, I don't think it's the consumers. I think it costs the petroleum companies a, a little bit of money because again, they have to sell non-petroleum products for the first time. Um, and I think the data proves this out. I mean, if you listen to their earnings calls, which is where they're pretty consistent, I mean, they'll talk about how it impacts profitability and they never impact, you know, they never talk about passing that on to the consumers. So I think it's just a, a minimal basic compliant cost for them that opens up the market and, and produces a lot of really positive things. Um, you know, you look at EIA data in California, I think some of the petroleum companies said that, you know, it was just going to blow up gasoline prices. And so you can go on EIA and I urge everybody to do that. And you can look at even pre-COVID gasoline prices to when the program began and it's cheaper, you know, and it's because now there's market competition. So we're talking about better air quality and little to no cost impact on consumers and um, opportunities for growth in these various fuel sources, including, you know, electric. Um, so what, what do you see as the opportunity for job growth? And like, Tim, how many, how many employees does Plug Power have in New York? And how do you, how do you see a clean fuel standard helping your, the you know, jobs uh, for your industry? Yeah, so, so right now we have, you know, probably close to 400 employees within, within New York. We have 1,300 across the country. Um, but a couple of things that are really significant that we've seen over the past few years, we've seen with hydrogen and hydrogen fuel cells, the demand for those products because of the, the benefits that they bring. You know, we've, we've seen an increase of 30%, you know, annually with, with what our customers are looking for from us. And that drives, you know, again, that scale. And um, in our innovation center that we're putting in Rochester, we're going to bring uh, 375 new jobs to that area. Um, in addition to that, there's going to be supplier jobs that are going to have growth there. Um, the facility that I talked about in New York to generate green hydrogen in Genesee County, that'll bring another 60 to 70 new jobs. Um, and so, and even last year during the pandemic, you know, we saw a workforce increase of about 49, a little bit over 49%. Um, so during a really, really tough time, um, the demand for hydrogen in our products continued to, to go up. Um, and as I mentioned before, the McKinsey roadmap study, um, you know, the, the growth that's seen in jobs in the United States, um, well over 700,000 jobs by 2030 and well over 3.4 million jobs by 2050. So it, it really creates an opportunity naturally for growth within the marketplace, which is just going to naturally create jobs. 
And Shelby, what about in the renewable fuel space? Uh, you know, well, we're not quite as big of an employer as, as Tim is. We have uh, 100 and I believe 22 employees uh, in New York and right across the river. But, you know, one thing I'd point out is that's 122 more jobs than the petroleum industry employs um, in the state of New York. Um, but I think the job creation story is, is, is really great. I mean, you look at California um, and what's happened there. California is a very difficult place to do light, ma light manufacturing, green manufacturing, you know, even those. But there's been nine biodiesel plants, two renewable diesel plants, uh, three more renewable diesel plants in construction phases. There's production of sustainable aviation fuel. You know, I think about 20,000 EV chargers. Um, of course, our, our corner of the universe is used cooking oil collection. You know, even in a, you know, something nobody ever thinks about used cooking oil collection, but we've seen dramatically increased rates in used cooking oil collection, uh, which means we hire more people to, to collect it and refine it uh, because you see less improper disposal. And then, of course, is, you know, the usual stuff more solar, more wind, the te Tesla manufacturing plant. And, yeah, in my opinion, I mean, there's no reason for any of that to be in California except for there's a low carbon fuel standard. So, uh, you know, I think where there's a new market for products and services that's developed, you'll see companies locate to provide those market, certain markets and, and services. And so that's happened in California, it's happened in Oregon, it happened in other places. And, um, you know, I think it'll happen in New York. I think one final point is these are generally good jobs. Um, I mean, just, just our jobs, for example, they're all, they're union positions, they pay above prevailing wages, and they have you know, all the same benefits that I have at the corporate office, you know, 401k, health, dental, same exact benefits. So, you know, these jobs are $50,000 and up on the renewable diesel side, 100,000 and up. So, you know, there, there are a lot of opportunities in this area. So Senator Saldana earlier mentioned, um, you know, the proximity to airports and uh, thinking about ultra fine particulate matter from uh, jet fuel. Are there, are there off-road benefits to a clean fuel standard? Um, Cause you know, that's not something we generally can regulate here at the state levels is things like sustainable jet fuel. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, particularly on renewable diesel. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we've talked about, you know complete elimination of air toxics and heavy metals and other things. But I think really the, the main benefit of some of these diesel alternatives is that they're incredibly flexible. So, I mean, just looking at the renewable diesel platform, which is kind of what, what we're involved with. I mean, you can do on-road, you can do off-road, you can do tractors, you can do space heating, you can do with some minor technological upgrades, you can do marine grade, aviation fuel, uh, you can even do Arctic grade, which can be used at the North Pole. So, so why does that matter? Um, because we, we do, like everybody, I mean, we see electrification coming on. We see the technology ramping up. It's exciting to see it. We're fans of it. Um, but there's going to continue to be significant, uh, you know, sort of gaps, you know, even by, you know, 2040, 60% of the medium heavy duty vehicles are still going to be on petroleum if we don't do anything. And so who's going to fill that gap? Well, it'll be products like renewable diesel. Um, but although on-road is the most important, we can't forget about other things. I mean, the aviation market in this country is 26 billion gallons. I mean, think about the emissions from 26 billion gallons of diesel. Marine is even far bigger than that. And so, like you mentioned, there are issues with, you know, the federal government and preemption. And so the clean fuel standard is really the only way to incentivize that. So I talked about how cost competitive biodiesel and renewable diesel are. Um, relative to, to diesel fuel. Um, but in terms of aviation, that's not where that product is. Right now, it, we're at sort of the, the front end of it, and it does require a CFS credit to make that product pretty significant capital, and, and, and capital opportunities there. So a CFS will get you sustainable aviation fuel. We're seeing it in California, and particularly on the marine side. California actually is getting ready to mandate 100% renewable diesel in, in the marine vehicles that don't go into international waters. And, and that's possible because of a CFS. Interesting. I did not know that. Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, one is, um, can, um, can one of you talk a little bit more about asthma and other health, uh, you know, other potential health benefits of a clean fuel standard and particularly in communities that are overburdened with diesel, bus, and truck depots and traffic. 
Um, we've seen communities in, in northern Manhattan and south and southern Bronx and throughout Brooklyn and Queens that have been disproportionately burdened by high levels of diesel pollution for decades. And if we adopt a clean fuel standard, won't that, won't that provide faster air quality and health benefits to those kinds of communities rather than simply waiting for the MTA to electrify its buses by 2040? Um, so Ben, do you want to start? Yeah. With yeah, I'm really happy to take that. I also appreciate the, um, the framing that's kind of inherent in the question around sort of galvanizing what your policy priorities and the public health imperative of the time is right now, right? Um, we don't want to sit around and wait for um, agencies to do what the, what the current market conditions dictate, which is something like a 2040 electrification mandate or, or commitment from the MTA for its uh, electric transit buses, for instance, which is still seen as fairly aggressive. Um, we know that diesel emissions from buses and trucks and where depots and uh, transfer stations tend to be located have been overburdening the same populations for decades. And it's really imperative that we accelerate that transition. So not waiting for private market signals to, to do that transition for us is really tantamount. And that means that we need to help to express our policy priorities in what the price signals end up being through things like a clean fuel standard, right? So if we can help shift the math, embed credit values in cleaner transportation fuels, that can help give MTA more of a boost as one example, right? So that the economics dictate on the purchasing and operation side that they can actually viably electrify more of their fleet sooner then that'll be all of the, that aligns all of the signals. There's no longer that tension between what the communities need, where MTA is operating and what MTA can justify with their operational budget. I think, um, Shelby, do you also wanna to touch on that? Cause uh, you know, even accelerating, we're still gonna have some diesel buses that are out there for a little while, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think a long time and, and um, you know, I think a CFS will help accelerate that, and that's a good thing. I mean, uh, particularly on the transit side, that's an application that makes sense in the very near term for electrification. But, but it's going to take a long time. It's going to take, you know, particularly these things stay on the road for 15 years. So the best you could ever do is one fifteenth of the fleet turnover. Um, so in the study I referenced a couple of weeks ago, they looked at about a dozen different communities around the country replacing uh, petroleum with alternative fuels, and they saw. 203,000 fewer asthma attacks, 203,000. You know, which, which you think, okay, 203,000, that's great. But, you know, you sort of flip that around, you think, wow, the current state of affairs is are causing a whole bunch of people, 200,000 people to have asthma who would otherwise not have asthma. And then there were about 1,100 fewer cases of cancer. Um, again, not an enormous number, 1,100, but Obviously, if you're one of those 1,100, it's significant. And, and because of we're, we're not doing things like a clean fuel standard, frankly, from my perspective, we're causing 1,100 cases of cancer. So I really think this is something we need to tackle in the near term. Great. Um, we only have a few minutes left. Um, I'm going to ask a question that I do not know uh, the answer to, which is always dangerous, right? Um, how would a clean fuel standard help buffer us from future oil supply disruptions like we've just seen with the cyber attack on the Constitution pipeline? Who wants to take that? Well, well, I'll start, I mean, because um, we had some experience with Hurricane Sandy, which obviously was very disruptive, but um, it was kind of ironic. There was a biodiesel mandate in the city of New York for heating oil. And, and the governor at the time waived that mandate but in fact, because the petroleum supply was, was disrupted, they ended up bringing in far more petrol biodiesel than they were using beforehand. So um, the vast majority of the petroleum in New York State comes on a pipeline. There are advantages of that. I mean, that's, that's a very efficient mode. But the disadvantage is that's it. Um, so if, if fast forward a few years with under a clean fuel standard, you have the ability to bring in you know, half a dozen different fuels under, you know, rail, seaport, pipeline, um, you know, th this would not be a problem. It certainly would not be the problem that is today. 
Anybody else want to weigh in on that or? I, I think Julie, anytime you can diversify your, your energy solutions, um, I think it just brings more ability to, to ride through and deal with disruptions and, and issues that come, whether it's natural or, or, or man-made, right? Um, you know, so having the ability for different solutions to provide, uh, to be available to you, um, will just continue to make things better. And then, you know, things like from our perspective, hydrogen also um, allows us locally, whether it's at the state or federal level, to have more control over our energy resources and security around those. So less reliant on, uh, you know, others, other sources of energy that might not be, um, you know, local to us. So, you know, I think it's just important to, that diversification can really help. Great. Well, I want to thank uh, you, Tim, Shelby, and Ben for participating in our panel today. Um, we are joined by our assembly sponsor, Assemblywoman Carrie Werner, um, to give us a few remarks in closing before I send us on our way. Thank you so much, Julie, and uh, thank you to the, the panelists, Shelby, Tim, and Ben, who came before me. I um, Fascinating remarks, and I, I look forward to watching the entire video um, because I feel like there was a lot of great information shared. I, I started down the path of, um, of a low carbon fuel standard in New York a couple of years ago, um, and, and it was really out of a recognition that the transportation sector is the largest contributor to greenhouse gases in, you know, in the world, but certainly in our state. And that there was a model in California that could provide a path forward for us. Um, and the more I have studied this, the more I have learned about it, the more I recognize that, that it really, it doesn't, as a, as a mechanism, it does something really important. And that's that it takes, um, it, it provides a means to go from early adopters to mainstream adoption. It, it fosters innovation and it, fo and it fosters the adoption of innovation. And as we think about what, what needs to happen to go from a, you know, a fossil-based transportation sector to one that is electrified, what we really are talking about here is the need to embrace innovation, to encourage the private sector to bring to bear um, all of the intelligence and capital and creativity that is locked inside their walls and bring it to bear to bring solutions to the marketplace that can be adopted by a broad spectrum of users. And that it's, you know, the Tesla can't be the electric vehicle for everybody. You know, they are, they are great early adopt, they are great for early adopters, but we need mainstream adoption, which means cars, trucks, long haul trucks, boats, ships, planes. We need, a, we need the innovation that's going to get us there. And a lot of people talk about, uh, well, you know, the fossil-based fuel companies have, have a lock on all of this and it's never gonna change and there's naysayers. But the reality is there will come a point in time when they're, they take the last drop of oil out of the ground that they can affordably take out of the ground. And, and if we can provide a mechanism to help them to, to encourage transition to a, to a, uh, a set of technologies that are renewable, that are uh, uh, the next wave, then we will have done a great service, not just to our environment, not just to our, our communities that are struggling with the health, health impacts of sitting next to a smoking diesel pipe for years, um, but we will have also helped transition an economy onto a much more um, innovative and long-term um, platform. So I, I think that this is just such an important moment in time for us where there has been enough, enough experience with early adopters. We understand the problem space. We now need a mechanism, an, an economic and policy mechanism to encourage the, the adoption of these technologies and the growth of these technologies on a, on a more broad spectrum. Uh, basis. So I think the low carbon fuel standard is the, is the policy model to get us there. 
and certainly all of the remarks that our speakers have um, shared with us just lend credence to that that viewpoint that this is our moment. This is a this is a proven model. It does not have a, a heavy consumer price impact, um, and it does serve to unlock the innovation and the and the creativity in the private sector and get them focused on solving these problems, pushing the envelope forward and getting us to um, a place where our transportation sector in all of its forms is on a low, is not poisoning our environment in the way it is today. So Julie, thank you so much for your leadership on this, for the coalition's amazing support um, and, and, and work on this. And I look forward to partnering with you to get this over the finish line this year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman. I think you said that exactly right. It's, you know, it's really, the enemy here is fossil fuels. And we need to move off of fossil fuels as quickly as we can um, and set the standards so that uh, you know, the, the economy knows where it's going. Um, we hear that all the time that the business community needs certainty and they need to have a direction to go towards. And this will help us, uh, help us to accomplish that and provide incentives to be innovative, um, come up with new and exciting ways in order to accomplish those goals of cutting our pollution uh, as well as fighting the climate crisis. So I wanna thank everybody who joined us this afternoon, our panel, Assemblywoman Werner, Senator Parker, Senator Saldana from uh, Washington State. Um, we hope you learned a few new things about the benefits of a clean fuel standard. Um, if you tune in late or would like to rewatch, the recording will be on our YouTube page at youtube.com.nylcv. Um, it will also be available on the Clean Fuels New York website, which is cleanfuelsny.com. Uh, org. Um, you can follow the coalition uh, or NYLCV on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram on at NYLCV and at Clean Fuels NY, uh, uh, or you can sign up for our email list at nylcv.org. I want to thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon.